Good morning. Good morning, members. It is Friday, March the 3rd at 2023 uh, at 8, uh, almost 845. Uh, and uh, I'm calling together the State, Local, and Veterans Committee to order. A quorum is present. Members, we are going to reorder our agenda just a bit, uh, and we're going to begin with Senate File 1259, Senator Mann's bill, uh, and then we'll move through and we'll take up Senator Muhammad's bill at the end of the agenda, as I understand it. Um, and so, Senator Mann, welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record, and let's proceed with your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Senator Mann. <laughs> good morning, Senator yeah, Mann. Good morning. <laughs> Um, uh, Madam Chair, I do have an amendment, an author's amendment this morning. So we have Senate file 1259 before the committee, and we have an author's amendment, which I believe is being distributed. So if you'll just make sure, Senator, we'll just pause for a moment, Senator Mann. Um, so we have the amendment, and then... And, and I would be happy to walk through that amendment if needed, Madam Chair. Thank you. And you have a copy of it, I'm assuming, Senator Mann? That's great. Why don't you proceed with the explanation of the amendment? Thank okay. you. So, um, well, the, the amendment is pretty much the bill. Um, so, um, Senator Mann, let's just put the bill in order then. If it's perfect. an author's amendment, let's it should lead all. Members, do you all have this? This is an author's amendment to get the bill into the shape uh, before us. Uh, so I, I will move the A3 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed, say no. And that motion is adopted. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, Senate file 1259 aims to establish a new hair technician license in Minnesota, which make it easier for individuals to obtain licensure and work as hair technicians. Uh, currently under Minnesota law, specialty licenses are available for nail technicians, estheticians, and eyelash technicians, but there is no license available for hair technicians. As a result, individuals who wish to provide hair services must obtain a full cosmetology license, which requires over 1,500 hours of instruction and training in nails, skin care, and hair, even if their professional focus will solely be on hair services. So this new license will provide a streamlined pathway for individuals to enter the profession, allowing them to gain necessary skills and knowledge without having to go through the more costly and time-consuming requirements of traditional cosmetology. Um, this bill is going to remove barriers for those wishing to enter the industry. So um, if you quickly walk through the bill, um, Section 3 will define a uh, hair technician. Section 7 will specify the requirements for obtaining the license. Section 10 will appropriate money for the Board of Cosmetology to modify its licensing system to add this new license. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I do have some testifiers. Thank you, Senator Mann. Uh, and I do want to make sure that people that are here with us today know that this is a hybrid hearing today. So we do have members uh, in Zoom. And once we get through your testimony, we'll make sure that we uh, acknowledge all the members that are in the Zoom and where they're at before we take further action on your bill. So please welcome uh, to your testifiers uh, to join us at the witness table. And we do have a couple of uh, testifiers that are going to require interpretation. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairs and members. My name is Nicauri Heredia Rosario. I'm the Legislative and Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. And I'm here today uh, on behalf of the Council in support of Senate File 1259. This bill is a big priority for us. For the past couple of years, we have heard directly from community members um, who share with us their challenges in getting licensed in Minnesota as um, as the state does not currently offer a hair-only license. Um, currently, as Senator Mann explained, anyone interested in cutting hair and coloring uh, hair needs to get a full cosmetology license, which includes uh, learning about nails and skin care, uh, many, uh, you know, skills that many people are not interested in and are not going to provide those services. Um, we also hear, um, heard from small business owners, salon owners, who are struggling to find uh, licensed uh, technicians and are on the verge of closing down. 
many in our community are interested in becoming hair technicians but cannot afford to pay for cosmetology school, which is quite expensive. On average, it costs more than $16,000. It takes about a year uh, for cosmetology students to graduate. And aspiring uh, tech uh, typically require, uh, acquire significant student loan um, debt. This bill, a, a hair only license, would make the licensee, licensing process less expensive as practitioners would only need to be trained and tested in the components that they will use. In your package, um, you will find letters of support from members of our community who could not be here today, but wanted to share their stories and express their support for the bill. This bill represents an opportunity to remove barriers for people who want to pursue their passion, provide for their families, and join the workforce. We urge this committee to support this bill and help us create this new license that will greatly uh, benefit many families and create jobs here in the state of Minnesota. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, welcome the, to the committee. Uh, Ms. Gomez, welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself and proceed. Um, good morning. Good morning. My name is Yolanda Gomez. Buenos dias, mi nombre es Yolanda Gómez, Miem buenos días, miembros del comité. Mi nombre es Yolanda Gómez y he sido estilista por 30 años. También soy madre soltera de tres hijas y me apasiona mucho ser estilista. Good morning, Chair Murphy and members of the committee. My name is Yolanda Gómez and I have been a hairstylist for 30 years. I am also a single mother of three daughters and I'm very passionate about hairstyling. Desafortunadamente, he intentado más de 12 veces obtener una licencia de cosmetología, pero el proceso es demasiado complejo para mí, ya que incluye contenido relacionado con servicios que no proveo. Unfortunately, I have tried over 12 times to get a cosmetology license, but it is just too complex since the test includes content related to services that I do not provide, such as skin and nails. Como ustedes saben, cada vez que tomas el examen tienes que pagar la tarifa y para alguien como yo se volvió simplemente demasiado costoso. Intento mejorar en lo que hago todos los días y tomo clases en línea ya que son más baratas que personas. As you know, every time you take the test, you have to pay a fee. And for someone like me, it simply became too expensive. I strive to improve my skills every day, and I take online classes since they are cheaper than in-person classes. Solo les pido, por favor, cambien las leyes y crean y creen una nueva licencia que permita a las personas trabajar en el cabello sin tener que gastar dinero innecesariamente, aprendiendo a hacer servicios que no proporcionamos. Necesitamos poder elegir qué servicios queremos ofrecer y ser evaluados solo en eso. I only ask that you please consider changing the laws and creating a new license that allows people to work on hair without having to spend unnecessary money uh, learning to do services that we will not provide. We need to be able to choose which services we want to provide and be tested solely on that. Si pueden simplificar este proceso, estarían, estarán proporcionando una oportunidad para muchos de nosotros de crecer en nuestra profesión y crear acceso a una licencia para muchos de mis colegas para tener una vida mejor. Muchas gracias. If you can simplify this process, you'll be providing an opportunity for many of us to grow in our profession and create access to a license for many of my colleagues allowing them to have a better life. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony and the translation. I appreciate both. Um, Ms. Ruiz. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Ruiz, and please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Buenos días, miembros del comité. Dios les bendiga a todos. Mi nombre es Isabel Ruiz. Estoy aquí en, 
en apoyo de este proyecto de ley que eliminaría barreras para personas Okay. Como yo, que están interesadas en trabajar y ofrecer servicio de cabello, pero no han podido hacer, 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 no he podido hacer. Good morning, Chair Murphy and members. God bless you all. My name is Isabel Ruiz, and I am here today in support of this bill that would remove barriers for people like me who are interested in working and offering hair services but have not been able to do so. Al igual que muchas de mis colegas han intentado muchas veces obtener mi licen la, lic la licencia de cosmetología, pero no he podido, no han podido debido al complejo del proceso. El proceso de licencia incluye demasi demasiadas preguntas difíciles sobre áreas en, el, en las que no estoy interesada. Una de las mayores barreras para obtener una licencia de cosmetología es que en este estado se nos requiere estudiar, estudiar y aprobar el examen de cuidado de uña piel, incluso si solo queremos hacer cabello. Like many of my colleagues, I have tried many times to obtain my cosmetology license, but have not been able to do so uh, due to the complexity of this process. The licensing process includes too many difficult questions on areas that I am not interested in. One of the biggest barriers to getting a cosmetology license is that in this state, we are required to study and pass the nail and skin care exam, even if we only want to do hair. Estamos solicitando alternativas que eliminen estas barreras para tener acceso a una licencia que nos permite cortar cabello y trabajar. Hay madres como yo que desearían tener la oportunidad de trabajar en un salón cortando cabello y apoyar a su familia, pero no hemos podido hacerlo. We are requesting alternatives that eliminate these barriers to have access to a license that allows us to cut hair and work. There are working mothers like me who would like the opportunity to work in a salon cutting hair and supporting their families, but have not been able to do so. Les pido que consideren crear una licencia de cabello que nos permita seguir nuestra pasión y elimine los gastos innecesarios de capacitación y puedan en, en servicios que no queremos ofrecer. Gracias por su tiempo y consideración. Esperemos que algún día esta licencia sea una realidad. Dios les bendiga a todos. I urge you to consider creating a separate hair license that would allow us to follow our passion and eliminate the unnecessary expenses of training and testing on services that we do not want to offer. Thank you for your time and consideration. We hope that one day this license will be a reality. God bless you all. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for being here today, both of you. Uh, we have three more testifiers this morning, so I'd like to invite um, Ms. Gina Fast. Madam Chair. Senator uh, Mann. Gina's from the Board of Cosmetology. Uh, we, she doesn't need to testify. She's here for questions. Thank you. Um, do you have other testifiers? No. We have two more then who have um, asked to testify on the bill. Um, so thank you, Ms. Fast, for being here. Um, uh, we have... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to say this next, last name right. So Martha from the Center for the American Experiment. And rather than mess it up, I'm going to have you introduce yourself for the record so we have it correctly on the record. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Martha Njolomoli. I am an economist at the Center of the American Experiment. So I know that we are here to specifically talk about hair uh, technicians, but I would just like to bring uh, to the attention of the committee that there are a lot of things in our licensing system that do not make sense, specifically in our cosmetology licensing system that don't make sense. So we have a good example is this thing whereby we do require 150 hours for somebody to become 
an emergency medical technician, yet when you just want to cut hair, you're required to take 1,500 hours of education. I think some people could argue that being an EMT is arguably more risky than just um, cutting hair. Another thing we do have is something that she, uh, Senator Mann has talked about, the fact that we do have these uh, specialty licenses for like nail technicians and eyelash um, extension technicians, but we do not have those same, that same specialty license for people who want to take care of other people's hair. Uh, another good example is the fact that when somebody doesn't get a license uh, in four years after going to a barber school, they're required to take 500 more hours of education, something that does not make sense either. It just costs people more money and you know waste their time. So I, I do support this bill because I believe that for people who would like to cut hair, it's, it's a good way to reduce uh, their burden and you know help them uh, get jobs. But I would implore the committee to look into doing more to reduce the burden that Minnesotans face in uh, getting a cosmetology license. And this should go for both barbers and people who want to do a full cosmetology license as well. I think there are a lot of issues that Minnesotans are facing and the hair care special license is just one of the uh, very few. So thank you for your time. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I would be glad to answer those. Thank you so much for your testimony and for being here. And will you be here when we get to the Q&A if people have questions for you? Uh, yes, Thank you very, very much. And then last, uh, Maureen Murphy from the Aveda Institute, my long lost uh, cousin. <laughs> I have a cousin named Maureen Murphy. Oh, sweet. Just, there you go. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the committee. done this before. Um, but thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Maureen Murphy and I am a cosmetology instructor at the Aveda Institute in Minneapolis and I'm also a former salon owner. Um, so when I heard about this bill um, I had some immediate concerns um, with the, the huge reduction in the number of hours that would be required um, a few things here. Um, part of it, and the first thing I went to was the public health concerns that could be, um, that could happen with underprepared stylists. Um, and then there was, you know, there is a cost to salon owners as well when you have underprepared stylists that come in different forms. Um, and then there's also a portion of this that seems to be a little bit, um, it's, it doesn't serve future cosmetologists and current cosmetology students as well as it might appear to in the beginning. So I'll start with the public health care concerns that I have. Um, the state currently requires us to have 240 hours just in infection control, safety and sanitation, proper disinfection of tools and equipment, um, the structure of the hair, so that when there's chemical treatments <laughs> happening, the hair is actually maintained, the integrity of the hair, um, and just overall safety, sanitation, and protection of the public from um, any types of things that can happen. You know, we've got there's different bacteria, there's different infections, there's all sorts of things that can happen during services that we at the school, and I hope all the schools are doing this properly to teach cosmetology students and future cosmetologists how to do this right so that the public is protected. And um, when I go into, when I think back to when I owned a salon, um, there's, Cosmetologists need to be prepared to do this when they're out. You know, if they aren't, it's going to fall on the salon owner. Any liabilities that show up from somebody having, you know, a hair chemical service that goes wrong, um, some kind of service that, you know, or if they get an infection from, you know, a dirty brush or comb or anything like that, the types of things that we try to kind of 
scare the students a little bit so that they really pay attention to. If there's not enough training on those types of things, and that's 240 hours is what the state has told us that we need to do, and I, I agree with that. It's a lot, and it's continuous throughout the training program. But those costs, those liabilities, would fall back onto the salon owners if something happened and they get sued. Their insurance will go up. They, you know, they could still end up having trouble and maybe losing their business if they have an underprepared stylist come in and do a service that goes wrong, you know, on a guest who might have a good lawyer. You know, I don't want that to happen. I was scared of that, you know, the whole time that I was a salon owner for four years. Um, but the other thing besides the liability is when a stylist comes in to work in a salon and they aren't prepared, you know, even if there's no health issues, there's still further training that has to happen. Um, I'm currently working with students that have right about 600 hours, what the state is proposing, and I don't think there's a single one of them, while they're good and they're like on a good trajectory towards getting to where they would need to be to be professional hair, um, to be hair professionals, they're not there yet. You know, they got a long way to go, and there's a lot of different things besides just cutting hair. You know, there's even just within cutting hair, um, there's many different ways to cut hair. There's different textures of hair to cut, and there's a lot to learn about all of those different things that take time, they take practice. Um, once or twice doing a particular service is not enough. And then that's not even counting things like hair color, you know, chemical texture, chemical changing of texture with perms and relaxers. Um, all of those things require a certain number of times to do it and a certain number of hours under the supervision of instructors before they can be, you know, sent out into the public, um, in my opinion. And you know, the other cost with salon, you know, to salon owners that can happen is redos. Let's say nothing actually goes wrong that would affect the public health, but the new stylist comes in at 600 hours and every single service they have to do has to be redone because it's not right, because they haven't gotten enough practice to do it right. Every time that guest comes back in, that's money that is not going into the salon owner's pocket because most salon owners would redo it for free. You know, when I had a salon, it was torturous pain when somebody had to come in for a redo because I knew that that stylist wasn't going to be doing a service for money and any product that I needed to use was going to come out of my pocket. Um, so, you know, I actually kind of went a little more into cosmetology, into salon owner mindset, even more so than. Um, cosmetology instructor mindset with regards to this. Um, and the public has high expectations of what we are going to be able to do. We need to be able to meet the public's expectations of what a cosmetologist or a hair professional can do. Um, there are some students out there who are amazing. And I, they make me so proud. Like the ones that, they, there's one and maybe a hundred that probably could get through in 600 hours, but most of them need more. And they need more supervision from us. They need a little more guidance. 600 hours isn't anywhere close to the number of hours that somebody would need in order to actually be able to succeed as a stylist. And that brings me to my third point, which is you know, the different costs to students. Um, you know, I'm not going to pretend that cosmetology school is inexpensive, because I know it is not, especially at Aveda where I work. Um, so that part, you know, I 100% understand. You know, that's a tough one. Um, I totally get it. That said, that doesn't seem to me a reason to make it 
that much easier. I mean, I don't want to sound like a jerk because I don't want it to be like, oh, this needs to be really, really hard. But there needs to be a good standard. 600 hours is not it to send a stylist out into a salon where they may or may not get any future training or you know, mentorship or apprenticeship to work with another stylist. If they're unprepared, they're gonna be set up to fail. And if you're set up to fail, you won't last in the industry anyway. You, know, you just won't. Their hearts break, even now as students, their hearts break when they don't get the client's service exactly right. And they have us to kind of guide them. If you're out in a salon working, you might not have that. You might just be like, well, now you just have to do it again and you have to figure it out on your own. And I just think that's unfair to a new cosmetology student. Um, Ms. Murphy, I'm just going to ask sorry. you to wrap up. Okay. We Irish have the gift of gab. Okay. Right? Sorry. I it's tried okay. not to. I took notes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. But yes, so that is my, that is my point and that is why I am opposing um, this bill and I so much appreciate you letting me talk too long. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Murphy, thank you much for your testimony mm -hmm. and for your clarity. You didn't talk too long, but you know, we're just going to keep moving. So sure. thank you. And you'll be here if there are questions. Yes, I will be here. Um, Ms. Murphy, if you wouldn't mind, there is another, there is a question. Yes. Um, Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Senator Mann. Um, so I, I just, just to kind of ask a question based on that, and I was listening on the way in too, so I caught the opening and introduction and I'm really impressed with my own Spanish skills because I caught a lot of the uh, <laughs> testimony without translation. Um, so you had talked about 240 hours kind of in the, this is for Ms. Murphy, um, in like the safety and all that stuff. And then the amendment, it looks like we have the first 300 hours are covering that. Senator Mann, is that correct? Madam Chair. Senator Mann. Yeah, so um, I wish we would have spoken before uh, because the Board of Cosmetology had some of the very same concerns that Ms. Murphy had. Uh, my own hairstylist had some of the same concerns that Ms. Murphy had. And she does an amazing job. Right? Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the amendment says that the first 300 hours will include chemical safety, hazardous substances, laws and regulations related to public health and infection control. And we also increased the total hours to 800 um, because of those same concerns. So we, we did... Um, the board, again, we went through this. The, the language you see now in the amendment is language that all the stakeholders and the Board of Cosmetology uh, sat down together and came up with together, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Mann. Senator McQuaid? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Senator Mann. I, I, that is what I wanted to clarify because what I was hearing, I was like, that's, I think that's in this bill and that's good. So that feels, that feels good to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. And yet this is the the whole point of a hearing process, right, is to make sure that the work that's being done among stakeholders with someone like Senator Mann is to bring forth and, and address the concerns that are being raised. So I appreciate that. I appreciate the delete all amendment. Members, uh, before we go to member questions, I just wanna check in with our, our two members, I believe, who are uh, with us virtually. So that is Senator Mitchell and Senator Lang. And if you could, Take yourself off mute. Let us know that you're here. Um, and there are three. Um, so Senator Mitchell, Senator Lang, and Senator Barr, if you could just check in and let us know that you're here uh, and where you're at, I'd be grateful. Good morning, Senator Mitchell. Good morning, this is Senator Mitchell and I am remote from Woodbury this morning. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Good morning, Senator Barr. Morning, Madam Chair, East Bethel, here and uh, paying attention. It's really beautiful and sunny in East Bethel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Senator Lang. All right, Senator Lang, we're gonna come back to you. I hope you're hailing from Olivia. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Senator um, Coran. Just, yeah, just a comment. Um, so, We've seen a consistent, just based on the last testifier, and, and many testifiers have not had, nor have we had, the actual language of a bill in a timely manner to be able to have a thorough assessment done on it. And so we've had many testifiers so far at the beginning of the year um, come in 
prepared <laughs> to talk about the version that was done and and they're fairly drastic changes. In this case, I, I like all the changes. But, but if we could have them more timely and so that at least the testifiers that spend the time to come down here and testify would at least know what the major changes were um, and so they could be prepared and before they arrive um, at the committee. So we would hope for that consideration in the future. Senator Cran, you are uh, like speaking straight to something that I think is really important, which is that we could, if we could agree together uh, to submit our amendments and make them public before the hearing, it would be really helpful for this process. And I'll talk with um, Lee Anderson to see if we could come to some better agreement about that. And I know that not every amendment is going to be ready 24 hours because of the pace of the work, but often we could get them in and make them public ahead of time. I agree with you, Senator Corrin. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I just want to echo, I think a 24-hour rule is a good thing. It makes us better lawmakers. It makes the process better. I know you support that too, so I'll just join in the chorus and say, particularly in committee. Um, I think it just makes the whole thing better. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. All right. Are there questions for Senator Mann? This is a bill that we're going to lay over uh, for inclusion, possible inclusion in our omnibus policy bill. Are there questions from members? Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Senator Mann, I appreciate you bringing this forward. I've, I've, I had a variety of issues with the original, um, but I do like the focus on, on hair technician. I, I, I assume this is a Board of Cosmetology push bill Senator one of Mann. Their policy bills. Madam Chair, uh, no, this was brought to me by the Council of Latino Affairs from the community. Awesome. Yeah. Senator Cran. And so you may be surprised that I've been, people have challenged me many times on the bills that I've supported, the hair braiding, uh, nails, lashes, um, you know, hair styling and, and those, those things that people can today in the service economy and service industry um, can make a great living in their home many, many times and, and um, I love it. I used to own a tattoo shop, so there's some commonality of, of uh, the, the burden of regulatory uh, elements that impede access to market. So I love the testifiers because I think all of the things that we've talked about and trying to simplify the regulatory pieces, um, I think the hair technician piece is good. Um, I appreciate you removing the stuff that um, expanded cosmetology's um, capabilities or rulemaking. In this one, in the training, there was a little conversation um, initially, and Senator May Quaid did a good job at safety is utmost concern. Is the 800 hours for the, the training on the hair, the hair technician, was that, was that a collective or was it modeled after some other state? And then what's the cost? Can somebody, I know there's somebody here from Aveda, but Anybody, any idea what does that reduce the cost in entry for just somebody that's interested in doing hair? I have no idea. Um, Senator, Senator May, um, thank you, Senator Coran. Senator Mann. I was looking for uh, Ms. Fast, if she knew that. I don't know where she went. And Ms. Murphy, if, if you want to respond, you're more than welcome, but you've got to come on up to the, you're more than welcome. We'd love to have your perspective. Ms. Fast, if you would inter introduce yourself for the record. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gina Fast. I'm the executive director for the Board of Cosmetology. Senator uh, Coran, we don't uh, regulate the, the cost. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you of what the, like a full cause it ranges from. Um, it, it can range probably from 10,000 to 25,000 and for a full cosmetology. Depends on the different type of school, but I don't have an answer for Ma you. Madam Chair. Senator Coran. Uh, Ms. Fast, so today, it just, just for everybody in the, that's listening, Today, for somebody to perform this task under the old rules, what would it require? What's the so I've, just in hours, right? In hours, and then average cost, and then so is it reducing it thirty percent for somebody that's entering just into the hair piece of that, um, without all of the other cosmetology requirements that it's removing? So that's I'm just trying to get an idea. Did it reduce it twenty percent or fifty percent? And if if not 50%, what do we need to do to, to make it even more competitive and more efficient for, for everybody who wants to seek this career um, to get into it safely but more efficiently? 
Ms. Fast. Sure, uh, Chair Murphy, Senator Curran, the current hours for a full cosmetology license are one, uh, is 1,550 hours, so it will reduce it down to 800, which my mathematician to the right said almost 50%. I, I don't do math when I'm under pressure at all. <laughs> Madam Chair. Senator Curran. Thank you, Ms. Fast. And so the other element to that is um, in the old rules, they would only be able to allow to be operate in a fully licensed uh, cosmeto or, or, a, or a facility with a cosmetology manager's license. Does Section 9 remove that requirement? Or the, or the modification in Section 9? Does it remove that requirement that somebody seeking a hair technician license can operate in their own facility without a manager's license? Ms. Fast. Sure, uh, Chair Murphy, Senator Curran. In Section 9, um, that is uh, the board issuing a, a single salon license. So the requirement to have a, a manager's license if you're gonna open up your own salon is a part of uh, law and rule, so that is not removing that requirement. This subdivision is under the salon licensing requirement. But you can get a manager's license right out of school now. There is no uh, prerequisite like there used to be of, uh, I believe it was, it's been so long, 2,700 hours of work experience, that was what it used to be. I believe pre-2016, so you, can, you could go and get your hair technician education, assuming this passes, and then become a manager immediately and open your salon you know, the day you graduate if you're properly licensed. So, Senator Curran. Madam Chair, so I'm still, help me out on this, and I'm still a little confused of the, um, what are the additional hours? So if somebody can ma get a manager's license um, within that 800 hours, that's, I don't believe is true. Um, or is it? If it is, that's great. What's the additional requirements to get that manager's license today in addition to the hair technician license? Ms. Fast. Sure. Uh, Chair Murphy, Senator Cran, it is an additional test, the salon manager test. It's a test on different parts of laws and rules, and that's it. And Madam Chair. Senator Cran. And so would that test be modified to just the um, service type or the services for a hair technician and, and throw out all the other um, requirements for a manager's license that involved other services that are outside of a hair technician if they chose to just offer that service? Ms. Fast. Chair Murphy, Senator Curran, the we will relook at the test, but regardless if you're an eyelash, nail tech, or SD, the salon manager test is about the facility requirements of operating a salon, and the questions should not be focused on like specific um, services within the salon, rather the infection control requirements of any salon. So I don't believe there will be modifications, but we review questions every year with the test, the, the state awarded testing vendor. Madam Chair, just Senator last question. Crane. And so with that, then somebody can obtain their hair technician license and then test out with, with whatever remedial information they need or to be prepared for for that test, and then they can take that test to pass out for a salon manager license to operate, if, if, if even just for themselves in the facility of their own, whether they bring on other hair te technicians or not. Ms. Fast. Chair Murphy, uh, Senator Curran, yes, you could graduate and become a manager okay. and all in the same day and you don't, eat, you don't pay for the operator's license, you go right to the manager if you submit the application okay. all at once. Uh, Madam Chair. Senator uh, Curran. Thank you and, uh, and thank you, Senator Mann. I think this is a great way to streamline and, and to get people into a, a great career. All of the things that we've heard in the past have typically been safety. We never want to compromise safety, no way. Um, but having a license doesn't guarantee your uh, business acumen or, or your services or quality are at, at, at market standards. And I'm comfortable that the market will continue to correct those things as you perform or don't perform services. And so I appreciate this movement. And so I've uh, been a fan of, of trying to make this process more effective and competitive for people to enter into that industry. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Curran. Members, are there further questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have here before me from the Office of the Legislative Auditor, January 2023, Board of Cosme Cosmetology Licenses, and they identify problems identified are 
uh, regarding complex licensing structure, no enforcement mechanism, and inconsistent regulation. And Ms. Fast, I'm wondering how you are uh, responding to the OLA report on, on cosmetology. And uh, thanks, Senator Anderson, and I appreciate that. And Ms. Fast, if you have a brief answer for that, especially if it relates to the bill, um, that would be great. And if there's a broader <coughs> discussion that needs to happen about the board's response to the OLA report, we, that can happen additionally in another space. Matt, Madam Chair? Senator Coran. Maybe to that point, um, if we could just ask Ms. Fast, as long as she's here, um, do you have a, an agency bill or a cosmetology board bill that we shall see in the future or not addressing those issues? Ms. Fast. Sure. Chair Murphy, Senator Anderson, and Senator Coran, um, I'm Last year, there was a, a, a very large agency bill that was worked on with the Senate and the House that um, did not get get passed or get signed. Um, I have been in conversations with Senator Mann in order to do an agency bill. Uh, this bill was uh, it was decided to focus on the hair hair technician piece, and we will be working to work on an agency uh, cleanup cleanup bill. Um, so th that's the way to answer your question. The, the findings were all legislative changes, and so it's, it's the direction in which the legislature would want the bill to look. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Senator Curran. Members, are there further questions for Senator Mann or these witnesses? If not, then I will move that uh, Senate File 1259 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, everyone, for being here on this Friday morning. Senator Bolden, who is with us. I'll move uh, Senate file 1481. Uh, so it is before the committee. Welcome to the committee, uh, Senator Bolden. I know you have an author's amendment. Madam Chair. That amendment is going to be uh, distributed just now. Uh, did you want to introduce your bill, or do you want to put the amendment on first, Senator Bolden? Um, I can introduce the bill while it is being distributed, and if I could get one, too, that would be excellent. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, committee members, for hearing this bill this morning. I'm grateful to be before you to present uh, Senate File 1481. Um, so since 1983, uh, special service districts have been a proven way for cities to provide an increased level of service or infrastructure not ordinarily provided throughout the city for the benefit of commercial or industrial areas. Special service districts are property owner self-imposed levies in a certain area within a city where special services are rendered and the costs of those special services are paid from revenues collected from service charges imposed on the properties within that area. It's important to note that special service districts can only be established if a certain percentage of the affected property owners file a petition uh, with the city seeking the increased level of service and agreeing to those charges. There are at least seven cities around the state that have special service districts, some with multiple districts, that have been requested by the property owners. Common services in special service districts include street and sidewalk cleaning, snow and ice removal, lighting, signage, parking enforcement, marketing and promotion, landscaping, and security. They may also include uh, capital improvements authorized in the special assessment statute. In my own district, for example, the City of Rochester's Special Service District is administered by the Rochester Downtown Alliance. As part of that, a Clean and Safe Ambassador Program provides cleaning, hospitality, and safety services to the 44 block Special Service District, which has helped keep downtown Rochester clean, safe, and engaging for our many visitors, including patients, residents, and businesses. Currently, special service districts allow, only allow the cost burden for special service district services to fall on commercial property owners, while residential properties, which may place 24-hour demand on the special service district services, are exempt from contributing to these special service district levies. 
So this bill uh, would add the ability for multi-unit residential owners to be included in the current special service district legislation through the same petition process in statute to allow property owners in each special service district to spread the cost of providing services across more of the buildings that are actually using those services. Additionally, this change could allow districts to raise more funding, more equitably, which would in turn allow districts to provide higher levels of service in a more sustainable manner. This legislation is simply a tool that could be available for communities if the property owners choose uh, to consider to use it. Uh, and with me testifying today, um, I have a couple testifiers, um, Daniel Lightfoot from the League of Minnesota Cities and Joe Spencer with the St. Paul Downtown Alliance. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Uh, would we, uh, before we take the testimony, should we uh, offer your author's amendment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, then uh, I'll move the A1 amendment so it is before us. Um, Senator Bolden, did you, did you want to describe it at all? Um, it's simple, Madam Chair, just uh, removing the first section. So members, uh, we're gonna vote on this, so we need to uh, call in our, our Zoom colleagues. And for those, for Senators uh, Barr, Mitchell, and Lang, if he's with us, um, if you can give us a thumbs up or say aye, uh, that would be great. So all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye or give me a thumbs up. Aye. 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 And those opposed, say no. And that amendment is adopted, thank you. Welcome uh, to the committee. And if you'd like to introduce yourself for the record and proceed to testify, thank you. Yeah, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Daniel Lightfoot with the League of Minnesota Cities. I um, want to thank Senator Bolden for now championing this bill in both the House and the Senate. Uh, so I appreciate her leadership on that. Uh, we do appreciate the opportunity to provide comments uh, on, the, on behalf of the League in support of Senate File 1481, which would add, as Senator Bolden mentioned, certain residential properties to also be eligible to be included to opt into special service districts under Minnesota Statutes 428A. Uh, the league supports the potential use of special service districts for mixed use properties that include residential and commercial industrial properties. And we've worked with both Metro and Greater, area, uh, greater Minnesota cities uh, that are our members and their downtown districts to uh, craft this legislation. Uh, in 1996, uh, the legislature gave uh, cities the general authority and statute uh, to create special service districts under 428A. Um, and cities around the state have used this tool to provide, uh, at the behest of property properties, increased level of uh, special services that are not ordinarily provided throughout the city from uh, general fund revenues. As Senator Bolden mentioned, uh, cities and their downtown areas have seen an increased presence in residential properties in their districts in recent decades. Um, in Minneapolis alone, there are 53,000 uh, residents in downtown, St. Paul 10,000, 2,800 in Duluth, and 1,800 in downtown Rochester. With the original special service district legislation uh, primarily covering commercial downtown cores in mind, the language no longer, in our opinion, reflects the mixed use reality of many contemporary city centers with the cost burden for special service district services only currently able to fall on commercial properties, uh, despite many residential properties, including mixed use buildings, uh, that often enjoy the services of the special, districts, the special service districts, despite being exempt from being included in the special service district. Um, we, uh, we appreciate that Senate File 1481 would provide the ability to allow districts more flexibility under the confines of the existing petitioning process for properties to opt in or opt out to better reflect the realities of our downtown areas to spread the costs to more of the buildings that are actually using the services provided by the districts, allowing districts to raise more funding, more equitably, resulting in a higher level of service in a more sustainable manner. The changes in 1481 would specifically not apply to affordable multifamily housing. Um, and Madam Chair and members, we are aware of some of the questions brought up by some other stakeholders, um, one of whom you'll hear from uh, after us. And we are certainly uh, committed to working with the, the Multi-Housing Association as well as the Minnesota Realtors um, and the Community Association Institute uh, on this language uh, to make sure that we're able to uh, address some of those concerns. And with me today is Joe Spencer from the St. Paul Downtown Alliance who can speak to the specific impact this legislation would have on a special special service district in downtown St. Paul and other growing downtown areas. Thank you. Thank Madam you, Chair. Mr. Lightfoot. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Spencer, please proceed with your testimony. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thanks for the time and the opportunity to, to, to share kind of our perspective from downtown St. Paul with you and in support of this. Uh, I'm the president of the St. Paul Downtown Alliance. We, we're an organization that's been around for just five years. Uh, and it's our mission to help uh, grow vitality in downtown St. Paul. And uh, when we first, when I, I'm the kind of first staffer for the organization, when I started, I looked around at other downtowns around the country to see what best practices are, what were the proven models to strengthen downtowns. And there is a ubiquitous model that just about every downtown you've been to uh, employs. And it's what most people call a business improvement district. Uh, it's a self-imposed and self-managed district to provide additional services. And the model that you see, again, across the country is uh, really it's the kind of defining characteristic is, is a safe and clean program. And so we adopted, uh, again, based on those best practices, we went through the process and created a district that launched in 2022. Uh, it has an exclusive uh, focus on improving safety outcomes and perceptions. We do that with uh, the, the kind of traditional safe and clean ambassador program that you see uh, in, in our downtown district. Uh, we also have a safety communication center, uh, a safety comms network that, that, uh, that creates a platform for private security, police, social service providers, to all be in communication and coordination with one another. Uh, and it's been uh, immensely successful. It's something that, uh, especially in the very uh, challenging uh, moments of the past few years for downtowns across America, it's something we've been really, um, uh, I wanna say, it's been a huge help, I suppose, as, as, we, as we tackle these challenges. Um, and in particular, having, having uh, the, the recent growth we've seen, the downtown population in St. Paul has doubled over the last 10 years. We've seen that similar growth across the country, including in uh, downtowns across Minnesota. That's something we really want to embrace, especially as we have a, a kind of cultural change toward uh, folks working from home or hybrid work situations. We need to have uh, in order for the downtown to be healthy and vibrant, we need to have more users around. And so increasing the residential population is really essential for us um, as we look at potential conversion of office buildings, as we look at just having more users around during the daytime. This is something that's essential for us. But what we don't want is for that uh, increase in proportion of properties that are residential to erode uh, the, the funds that we use to support the services that made the downtown attractive in the first place. Uh, in particular, in downtown St. Paul, again, we started by talking to property owners about what services they might want and be willing to pay for. Uh, we drew the line at Jackson Street. We don't provide services in Lower Town because, as if, if you are familiar with downtown St. Paul, Lower Town is a really high proportion of residential properties, and there's simply not enough of a fee basis in commercial and industrial property to cover the cost of the services. Uh, and those folks in Lower Town, those residents really want these services. They've organized themselves. They have a group called the Lower Town Futures Fund that actually explored finding a way to create their own district. Uh, they looked at, at uh, 428B as that, the housing Im improvement area as a, as, a, as a hopeful way of solving that problem. And as you likely know, that, that just doesn't really apply to services. And so um, we are kind of united in our support for this so that we can expand our services to include all of downtown in a way that's sustainable and consistent across downtown St. Paul. We think that's the, the kind of the key to the future uh, of the health of downtown and, the, and the, the health of a kind of a really important economic driver for not only all of St. Paul, but the region. So with that, I'll bring my comments to a close. Thank you so much for your time and thank you, Senator Bolden, for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. And will you both be here when we get to the Q&A period? Thank you very much. And I think we have one more testifier, Mr. Hines. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed to your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. My name is Patrick Hines with Messerly Kramer. I represent the Community Associations Institute, the Minnesota chapter, the CAI represents the interests of homeowner associations, including their residents, their volunteer boards of directors, and all the companies that uh, help to serve the HOA needs. Um, I haven't spoken with Representative Bolden yet, but I have had multiple conversations with uh, the League of Minnesota Cities and Mr. Spencer about the bill. Um, we certainly understand 
the change in uh, living situations in, in the downtowns in many of our cities, um, and that's a great thing. Multi-use properties have uh, increased significantly, and um, I think this statute is uh, attempting to address that. Um, our concerns um, are, are more with how it will interact between, uh, how the interaction occurs between CI property and residential property because the statute was designed, as Mr. Lightfoot and others said, for commercial industrial property. So a, a couple points. When we talk about spreading the cost burden across buildings, um, I, I want to make sure everyone's clear that the only way your HOAs are paying for this is by the individual homeowners paying for it. It's a very different dynamic than a for-profit business which can raise costs on the items that they sell. They could uh, you know, generate additional income from um, the services that are provided through the special service district to recoup their costs. Um, homeowner associations don't have that ability. Homeowner associations are a nonprofit organization. Um, every year they determine what their budget is. Those are generally all hard costs like utilities, snow removal, Maybe you have an on-site property manager in a downtown building. You have those hard costs each year. They're divided amongst the residents paying their annual assessment and monthly dues. Um, there's no way for a homeowners association to generate additional income from the services that a special service district provide. So if they are part of it, their homeowners will be paying it themselves. Um, I just want to make that point because it is a distinction that's important between commercial and industrial property. Um, the statute itself is, is kind of complicated in how it works, um, and I just I do have some concerns with how the voting would work. Again, if you'd have a um, multifamily residential property that's an HOA, if you have 100 units, each unit, each owner owns their unit and then one one hundredth of the common elements of the association. And that's different than how a business is owned. And so each individual unit owner would have a vote on this. And their vote can be pretty diluted because just of the size of their unit. Um, you have many apartment style condominiums where you have certain units that are much larger than others. Um, if you have a 2,500 square foot unit, um, that's different than having a thousand square foot unit and the calculation based on area and tax capacity means the votes are not equal between residents living in the same building. So there is a concern that you could have um, a majority of residents opposed to expanding this, but because of the way the tax capacity and square footage is calculated, it would still go forward. So. Um, I, I don't think those concerns are, it mean that there's no way the bill could be crafted in a way to you know, accommodate those concerns. Um, and we're committed to working with uh, Senator Bolden and others uh, to try to find language because we do acknowledge that multi-use HOAs are a big part and a growing part of our cities and we recognize that. Thank you. I'll stand for questions if you have any. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Heinz. With that, members, do you have questions for the author of the bill or any of our testifiers? Senator Curran. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Senator Bolden, on the, um, just on the, go back to the, your author um, amendment, striking section one, um, it brings up the question, one, tell me what, it, what that did. It looks like it removes the uh, um, non-residential partners or petitioners from the election or the determination. Is that what it does? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, it removes a definition that is not needed. It, um, in previous versions, language of this bill, it, it was needed with this new version of the bill. It is just not needed. So it's just removing a definition that's not needed given the language of this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. S Senator Curran. Senator Bolden, so on the, um, when a special service district or they look to expand as this proposal does, um, do the non, uh, the members that aren't, were being expanded to, are they included in that current election on the expansion? Do they get a voice and a vote, those in the multifamily units? 
do those properties get a vote when they go to expand? They're not a member of the special service district because it's being expanded. Do those non-members get a vote in determining whether they, well, just do they have a say or can all current members expand that boundary without their participation? And they would get a vote then in future, uh, future elections or expansion debates. Senator Bolden, and welcome back to the committee, Mr. Lightfoot. I think I'll defer to Mr. Lightfoot. Then. Mr. Lightfoot. Madam Chair, Senator Cran, yeah, thank you for the question. And, and, and uh, Mr. Hines absolutely pointed out that 428A is, is fairly complex, so I, I appreciate that. Um, the Madam Chair. Senator the, Curran. The, the question is not that complex. Do they get a vote, yes or no, in the expansion when it's being imposed upon them? Mr. Ma Lightfoot. Madam Chair, Senator Curran, the, the answer is yes. The, the initiation to expand a district um, in, the, in the bill based on the origin of the special service districts legislation uh, statute comes from the non-residential properties. Um, however, in the petitioning process under Section 428A, the residential properties would also have a proportionate voice uh, to meet that threshold to either establish the additional uh, the, the additional rate payers in that district um, or an expansion of the boundaries. So, um, th so the answer to your question is yes, there would be a proportional voice uh, in the expansion of that district. Thank you, Mr. Lightfoot. Ma Madam Chair? Senator Curran. So on the uh, affordable, the exclusion for the affordable housing, is that just done on a percentage of the entire property or just based on the percentage of units occupied in any, any facility if it's a mixed use as far as those meet? Uh, affordability criteria. Mr. Lightfoot. Madam Chair, Senator Coran, uh, section, uh, section five of the bill, sub 11, um, defines affordable housing unit as a, a residential unit affordable to households with incomes uh, at or below 80% of area median yep, income. Madam Chair. Senator so Coran. In a mixed facility that has market rate and affordable, how is that applied? Mr. Lightfoot. Madam Chair, Senator Curran, uh, the, the applicability would still exist uh, for the market rate units and well, the 80% the AMI units or below would be excluded. Thank you. Madam Chair, my Senator last question. Curran. My last question. So um, of the special services, Senator Bolden, when you, you started to say what they were, um, many of them didn't sound like special services, but obligations that a city used to provide. Um, what are those services? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. So um, just to sort of review some of the um, uh, examples I gave, sidewalk cleaning, so and ice removal, lighting, signage, parking, parking enforcement, marketing, promotion, landscaping, security. So there may be some of those where there's sort of a baseline that is required to be um, provided by the city, but these would sort of be above and beyond that enhanced services. And you know, I would argue even not all of those are required to be provided. Madam by Chair. Senator Coran. Senator Bolden, um, many of those you described are, are uh, used to be provided by the cities and our basic services. And so it's unfortunate that the businesses in the community have to pay extra, again, even though self-imposed and they get a choice. Um, they still seem like a variety of what the city's obligations were, snow removal and all those things. Um, and to me, it's just an example of uh, the city's not performing their basic obligations and the business community being desperate for survival to have to pick up the, an additional cost to provide or pay twice for services they should have already been providing. So um, it's unfortunate that that's probably a, great, a trend that will continue. And I don't think it makes St. Paul or Minneapolis any more affordable to live in. Um, hopefully it makes it more attractive. I think that's the goal. But um, most of those should have been services the city's already providing. So thank you. Madam Chair, if I made it that point. Mr. Lightfoot. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Cran. Um, appreciate that question. Section 428A in statute does require that the special services under uh, a special service district um, are services that uh, are not ordinarily provided throughout the city from general fund revenues of the city. 
um, unless an increased level of the service is provided in the special service district. So there are there are instances where, um, of course, uh, snow removal in the public rights of way, um, police uh, and, and other uh, services that are generally provided for, by the city are still provided, of course. But there is there are instances where business communities, uh, businesses, and mixed use buildings as well um, do opt to require a, a higher level of those services, snow removal from, you know, frontage that, that wouldn't necessarily be considered um, the public right of way and would generally be provided by the city. Um, so I just wanted to make that point clear. Senator Coran. Thank you, Senator Coran. Are there other questions, members? All right, then. Uh, seeing no further questions, this is going to go to the general register. So. I will move that Senate file 1481 as amended be recommended to pass. Uh, those on Zoom. Uh, those on Zoom. Uh, so all those in favor, please say aye or signal aye. 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 The and those last area was looking at his adaptive skills. Once again, really comparable. And rated him as an 80. Yeah, the communication is what brought that score down. Um, for all right. So all those in, I'm going to do this again on Senate file 1481 as amended be recommended to pass. All those in favor, please signal aye. 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 And those opposed say no or signal no. 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 All right. Uh, that motion is adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. And I'm not quite sure what that technical uh, glitch was, but... Senator Mohammed. Good morning. Good morning. We just have two bills left, members. We have Senator Mohammed's bill, um, 1658, which we plan to lay over. Uh, Senator Mohammed, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Murf Murphy and members of the committee. Um, this uh, before you is Senate File 1658, which is uh, Majority Leader Dietzik's bill, and I'm presenting for her today. Um, this bill would designate the Bill and Bonnie Daniels Firefight Firefighter Hall and Museum located in Minneapolis as the official state museum, state fire museum as one of the largest fire museums in the nation and the only firefighter museum in the state of Minnesota. This museum honors and preserves the rich history of their work in our state. There are thousands of artifacts, including an extensive collection of literature and records um, and historians and more. This museum also delivers public education programs and fire safety demonstrations to Minnesota and community, to, to students and community members across the state. And with that, I have a testifier, Tom Bruce, with me. Thank you, Senator. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Tom Brace. I'm the former Minnesota State Fire Marshal from 1987 to 2003. And prior to that, I was the Washington State Marshal for 10 years. I'm here as the uh, chair of the Bill and Bonnie Daniels Fire Museum. Um, asking your concurrence to designate uh, the museum, the fire museum, as the official state fire museum. Now, we're not trying to change the name of Bill and Bonnie Daniels. In just 30 seconds, Bill and Bonnie Daniels, um, Bill was a, um, a captain on the Minneapolis Fire Department that uh, donated monies <clears throat> to establish through a trust this fire museum. And we've been in 664 22nd Avenue Northeast for, <clears throat> since 2004. Not unlike we have a designated uh, state bird, a loon. We have a designated muffin. I believe it's blueberry. Uh, we've designated a lot of things. Uh, we would respectfully ask that we uh, designate uh, this uh, museum, the largest uh, north of Chicago, uh, as the official state fire museum. And seriously, what we really are looking for is to send a message to the fire service, 
across the state of Minnesota and the citizens that this is a museum for them, uh, explaining and defining and uh, illustrating uh, the Minnesota Fire Service, its proud uh, and uh, challenging history. And we um, hope that you will concur with us that it warrants the official tag, if you will, the official name, uh, the, the Minnesota State Fire Museum. Thank you for your testimony this morning. And I do believe I have been to said uh, fire museum. Um, and I learned a lot. Uh, members, other questions? All right, then. Uh, with that, Senator Mohammed, thank you so much for being here today for um, carrying this bill with Senator Dietzik. And we will uh, lay Senate File 29, uh, 1259, Senate File 1259 over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Oh, I'm going to do that again <laughs> because I said the wrong number. So, members, we're going to, I will move that Senate File 1658 be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. All right. We have one last proposal before us today, and it is the proposal of Senator Dibble from Minneapolis, Senate File 2165. Welcome to the committee, Senator Dibble. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I am pleased to be back in front of this august panel. We're so happy to have you here. Second <laughs> appearance this year. It's a good one. So if you'd like to proceed, uh, we have Senate File 2165 before us. Thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File number 2165, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just going to give a very brief and high level description of what's proposed. And then we have Council Member Rainville here who can speak more about why this is a good idea. Um, so very quickly, uh, what this would do, uh, Madam Chair, is it would uh, convert, if you will, the oversight and management of Minneapolis City Hall, I think formerly known as the Municipal Building, which is actually a shared facility between Hennepin County and the City of Minneapolis, from uh, the current structure um, under which it operates, which is known as the Municipal Building Commission, which is a separate kind of independent entity of those two jurisdictions um, and would convert it to some other instrument or structure that Hennepin County and the city would uh, enter into, formalize either a joint powers or a memorandum of understanding or some such um, sort of understanding. Currently, uh, uh, Madam Chair and members, um, as, as you are probably aware, Minneapolis City Hall is where um, the city council, the mayor, are housed as a, a number of other city offices. That's where um, the council meets, um, et cetera. Um, a large number of the, the, the building itself has grown too small for both the services and programs and departments of both entities. The county occupies, I think, about 40% of the building at this point, the sheriff and I think some courts and, and there are still some detention facilities there. The rest of the building is occupied by the city government and some of the uh, departments of the city. Kitty Corner from City Hall now is a large municipal building, brand new if you haven't seen it, it's beautiful. And of course across the street is you know, the big toaster, um, Hennepin County Government Center where the bulk of Hennepin County uh, programs and departments are housed. A little bit about the building. Um, I've passed out a little, a little booklet. There's three of them, so if you want to peruse it and pass it along, it's kind of an interesting little um, study of the building. It was built in uh, between 1887 and 1906. Um, it's, the rich, it's in the Richardsonian Romanesque style of architecture. It cost at that time $3.5 million to build, which would be about $100 million in, in today's dollars. Um, as a point of reference, this building cost about $90 million to build. 
Um, and the clock tower is 345 feet high, and the clock face, I did not know this until I was perusing around this morning on Google to make this presentation slightly more interesting. The <laughs> clock face is um, larger than the clock face of Big Ben at, in Westminster in London. Um, it's built from red granite that was quarried in Ortonville, which is in Big Stone County in Senator Dame's district. Um, and the Father of Waters statue, which many may be familiar with, gigantic statue in the front foyer of City Hall, was originally actually commissioned for the city of New Orleans, hence it has turtles and, and, uh, and an alligator. Um, but New Orleans couldn't afford it, so a group of citizens raised the money to buy the statue and bring it here to Minneapolis. With that, I have City Council Member Rainville who can share some more about dissolving the Municipal Building Commission and converting how the building is overseen and managed. Thank you, uh, Senator Dibble, and welcome to the committee, Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Senator Murphy. And uh, Senator Dibble, you have, you have quite a historical background. Thank you for that. So Chair Murphy and members of the state and local government and veterans committee, good morning. I am Council Member Michael Rainville, Vice Chair of the City of Minneapolis Intergovernmental Relations Committee, and I'm here to testify in support of Senate File 2165. I would like to thank Senator Dibble again for bringing forward this legislation to eliminate the Municipal Building Commission. We're here today with our partners in Hennepin County and our labor unions to request the repeal of the outdated law that created this independent body. The Municipal Building Commission has operated the Municipal Building, better known as City Hall, or the Hennepin County Courthouse, uh, since 1904. Chapter 395 of the Special Laws of 1887 was enacted at a time when Minneapolis and Hennepin County did not have buildings of their own and the current City Hall Courthouse building was constructed and occupied as shared office space. At this point in time, both the city and county own a number of buildings, and the city is a primary tenant in the building. The city and county agree that the building could be operated more efficiently and effectively without this independent commission, and ask that you repel the special law to allow us to operate the building in a manner more consistent with both of our government bodies' current operations. This would allow us to more effectively coordinate activities related to maintenance and security within our current for, uh, workforce. Thank you for time and consideration. I stand for any questions you may have. Thank you, Council Member Rainville. Members, do you have questions for the Council Member? All right. Um, thank you very much for your time and your testimony this morning. Thank you, Chair Murphy. You're welcome. And I know we have two more testifiers, or I understand we do. Yes, Madam Chair. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Peterson. Peterson? Peterson? You, welcome Chair. to the committee. Kirk Peterson. Uh, even though it's P -E -D -E -E -S -S -E -S Peterson. Uh, I'm with Hennepin County. I want to thank Senator Dibble for authorizing this bill and for uh, you, Madam Chair, for uh, giving me the opportunity to hear it. Uh, Hennepin County fully supports this legislation, and we look forward to working with the city on developing a new, <coughs> modern, updated uh, working agreement to manage this, the current city hall building. Uh, a lot of this has already been covered. Uh, Mr. Peterson, uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure that your mic is amplifying. Okay. okay. Is that better? There we go. Now we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as Senator and, and the council member have already indicated, the MBC was created in 1903, stop, started operating in 1904, and it's really an outdated business model for running the city hall, uh, which, um, as Senator Dibble correctly pointed out, the city um, occupies about 60% of the space right now. The county operates about 40% of it with our sheriff's office, the jail, uh, and some court functions. Um, one interesting little note that hasn't been covered yet, when the building was originally constructed, it uh, included a chicken coop and a blacksmith shop. And so my only criticism of this bill as it's written is that it does not require the city to put back the chicken coop and the blacksmith shop into it. So maybe the uh, author would be willing to have an amendment on that. It certainly sounds like something that the city council should take up. Yeah, so I'll talk to the council member <laughs> Randall about that. There are also so. horse stables. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Madam Chair, without taking up any more time, we do support this. Uh, we've got um, uh, 
labor unions have been involved in the negotiations to make sure that the current employees of the commission will be, uh, won't lose their jobs. And uh, we just think that this is a necessary way to go, that we will work with the city on creating a new joint powers agreement or some other structure to better operate, uh, better operate this historic building. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Mr. Kyle Macarios. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Senator Dibble, committee members. Um, my name is Kyle Macarios. I'm here on behalf of the Minneapolis Building and Construction Trades Council. Uh, the Minneapolis Building Trades represents about 10 in-house full-time employees of the, Minneapolis, of the uh, Municipal Building Commission, and we support uh, Senate File 2165. Um, thank you, Senator Dibble, for doing this. We agree that the Municipal Building Commission has outlived its usefulness in, in support modernizing the governing structure of the building. Um, we appreciate um, the language in Section 5 of the bill that, that requires um, there to be an agreement with the, the uh, bargaining units uh, that, that represent the current employees of the uh, Building Commission and um, appreciate that uh, the city and the county are going to make sure that our folks are taken care of. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Macarios. Senator Dibble, anything more? Um, Thank you again, Madam Chair and members, for the opportunity to present Senate File 2165. This is a fairly simple, good government, tidying up, making things more efficient subject. Thank you. Members, do you have questions for Senator Dibble? Senator Anderson. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I would just like to have counsel uh, give us some idea of what the repealer in the bill is about. Council White. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Anderson, that repeals all the um, statutes that cre actually created the um, commission. So, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble. I'm not sure if the repealer is printed. It might be in the very back of your um, bill, copy of the bill itself. You can see um, it's... Senator Dibble, it is five, there. Yeah, five sections. This was enacted in 1904, 383.75, which established the Municipal Building Commission. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble, um, will this uh, in increase any uh, necessary expenses from county or from the city as far as making this transition? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Senator Anderson, I'll let... Councilmember Rainville answer more fully, but I believe that it would accomplish the opposite because we have a separate entity. This is separate from the city of Minneapolis, separate from uh, Hennepin County, a whole separate structure, um, and, that are, and then we have employees of that structure, um, and that would go away, and those employees would become city of Minneapolis employees, and there would be no, uh, none of that additional um, structural overhead that would then follow having the separate entity budget. Council Member Rainville knows better than I Council do. Member Rainville. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, that's a very good question asked, and I agree with uh, Senator Dibble. Uh, we agree at the city that this will reduce our expenses. It will maintain our workforce. No one will lose a job, and we're, both the county and city will save money. Senator Anderson, thank you. Are there other questions? Then seeing no further questions, then I'll move uh, that Senate file 2165 be laid over for possible inclusion in a policy omnibus bill. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Members, uh, that being the balance of our work, uh, I'm going to uh, adjourn our meeting. Thank you very much for doing a Friday morning. We will likely do another Friday morning to make sure that we're getting through our work. And in the meantime, I will be in communication with Senator Anderson about the potential of getting more of our amendments uh, before us before we meet. Madam With Chair. that, Senator Anderson. Uh, will we be having any uh, veterans' bills before the deadline? A absolutely, uh, we will. And I believe that we will do the bulk of those in one hearing, Senator Anderson. We have just that small amount? We have uh, a number of bills that we will hear. Okay, look forward to it. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Seeing no further questions or business before us, our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>